Amen. Well, good morning, Mercy Church. I hope you all are well this morning. If you don't know me, my name is Derek Smith, and I'm the campus pastor here, and I'm so glad to worship Jesus with you and share God's Word with you this morning. If you are new to Mercy Church, you have called us week two of a new sermon series entitled The Great Pursuit, where we are looking at God's great pursuit of you and God's great pursuit of the world through you. So we are going to pick up there this morning. We're going to be in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28. So if you would take out your Bibles, meet with me in Matthew 28, verse 18, and when you get there, say amen. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. Amen. Amen. I was reading a story this week on World War I that happened in 1914, and what I was discovering was the British government had wanted Australia to ultimately take over German Samoa, and so they called all of these different troops in to kind of go and take over this territory. And the thing I was learning about it was, ultimately what they discovered is that there were these territories that had great wireless communication, and so they didn't want the Germans to take over these small little territories on the island, so they wanted the British government wants to get in before them to overtake them because there was a lot of great intel and communications and logistical information that was being exchanged. And so all of these troops assembled together and they were given something called a sealed order. Now a sealed order is an ancient term dating all the way back to the 1500s where basically what would happen is someone of a higher power in the military will give an order, they would give it to a squadron or a group of troops, they would give them this order and that order will come in a sealed envelope. And here's the thing, the captain or the highest ranking official was not to open that envelope until they got to sea because they needed to maintain operational secrecy. Inside the contents of that envelope would be the specific mission that they were to accomplish. So imagine being in one of the branches of the military and receiving a seal order in an envelope, not knowing exactly what you're getting ready to embark on, but the moment you get to sea, the highest person in command tells you, hey, this is our mission, and we are to accomplish it. Well, all of the troops assembled together, and they accomplished the mission. They pursued the mission, and they were able to overtake the territories in the year 1914 and get the victory. Well, what you're going to see in our text this morning in Matthew 28 is that God has given us a sealed order. Jesus Christ, the commanding officer, has given us a very specific mission that we, the church, are to accomplish. It is very strategic and it is very clear. It is a directive that we are to align ourselves around as the body of believers, the body of Christ, and we are to pursue that mission. Here's what that mission will say, verse 18, Jesus came near and said to them, all authority in heaven has been given to me, in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the very end of age. Let's pray. God, we come to you this morning and we thank you for the gift that we can assemble together to worship you, Jesus, to lift up the only name that has power, the name that is above every name. And so, Lord, as we dive into your word this morning, Holy Spirit, would you speak to our hearts? Would you change us? Would you help us become better worshipers of you? Father, I pray for every person who came in this morning, including myself, who has distractions. Lord, I pray that you will rebuke the enemy in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that our hearts will be open, our minds will be open, our ears will be attentive to what thus saith the Lord. And God, I pray that I would decrease and the Spirit of God would increase in me and proclaim your word, your mission for your people for such a time as this. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray and all God's people said, amen. amen. The mission that Jesus gave to his disciples in Matthew 28 is the same mission that he has given us, the body of Christ, the church. And that mission is very simple and it is clear. It is to go and make disciples of all nations. And so the main point of my sermon this morning is two simple words, make disciples. Make disciples. If you are taking notes, that is the main idea of the sermon, make disciples. And what I want to do in our time this morning is I want to walk us through these verses, and I want to help us to understand what a disciple is, and then I want to pull out two truths to help you make disciples. Give you a definition of what a disciple is, and then I want to give you two truths to help you make disciples. 
Now, I give you this disclaimer. If you've been around church for a while or in church for a while, you're probably thinking, man, I've heard millions of sermons on Matthew 28. And duh, Pastor Derek, I know, go make disciples of all nations. And I will say to you, if that is what you're thinking, my question to you this morning will be, are you doing it? Are you doing what you already know? It is one thing to receive a seal order from God to go and make disciples of all nations. It's a whole other thing when you are obedient to what the Lord has called us to do as a church. The stats show that 75% of non-believers are willing to engage in a spiritual conversation, but only 25% of Christians ever share the gospel. So are you doing what our great Lord has called us to do? So maybe for you this morning, what is shared in this sermon is exactly what you need to compel you to be engaged in the mission of God. And then for those of you who are sharing the gospel, maybe this is what you need to be encouraged, to be affirmed in disciple making. But I want all of us this morning to listen with fresh ears what God has for us. Amen? Amen. From the very onset of Scripture, from Genesis all the way to Revelation, what we discover is that our God is a missionary God. God has always been in pursuit of His people, the very people that He created. Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, God creates the first human beings, Adam and Eve. He pronounces His blessing and favor upon them. He says, go, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. In other words, what God was doing is saying, hey, I want you to go populate the world, spread my glory, spread my presence, spread the shalom of God, because I want the whole world to be filled with my glory. All throughout the Old Testament, every single scripture, every single chapter reveals to us that God is a missionary God, that God is constantly in pursuit of the very people that he created, and God is constantly drawing people to himself in a relationship. This is then culminated in the New Testament with the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the greatest missionary ever. He left the heavens and he came to earth to bridge the divide between us and a holy God. God is a missionary God. Jesus would say in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, that his mission was to seek and save the lost. That is why he came from heaven to earth. God moved closer to fallen humanity through the incarnation, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And now when we get to Matthew chapter 28, Jesus has just resurrected from the grave, and his final words, his last command, the highest priority, the seal order to his disciples is this, go and make disciples of all nations. But notice what Jesus says right before he gives them the mission to go and make disciples. Verse 18, he says, all authority in heaven has been given to me. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Truth number one, you need God's power to make disciples. You need God's power to make disciples. My older boys and I were recently at a FC soccer game here in Charlotte, and if you've never been to one of those games, it's a game you should go to. Tickets are about 20 bucks, they're fairly cheap, but it's a game you should go to. There is a lot of energy in that stadium. The crowds are, it's just crazy. It's a lot of cray-cray people, aka crazy people. They are just cheering, they are chugging things when you score. It is, it's quite interesting. But I was thinking about this and I was like, the person that I do not want to be on the field is the referee. Think about it. The referee is praised or booed. They're loved or hated, celebrated or dishonored. The referee has jurisdiction over the entire game. They have authority. They have power. With just one blow of the whistle and one flick of a card, the entire game can change. You see, entire championship games are changed forever because of referees. A whole game can rise or fall on one call from a referee. And some of you know what I'm talking about this morning because your blood is boiling. You're thinking about those particular games where the ref made a bad call and your team lost and you're still dealing with that anger and you need Jesus to forgive you. It's all right. I know. Been there, done that. There is freedom in the Lord. But the referee has authority, has power. That's a weighty task and a big responsibility to be a referee and have jurisdiction over an entire game. Well, the authority that Jesus speaks of here is beyond that of a referee. Jesus has authority over the heavens and the earth. With just one word, the stars and the mountains and the entire universe came into existence. With just one word from Jesus, the dead can come back to life. Jesus is all powerful. Jesus is all wise. He has power over all people in their hearts. 
Proverbs 21.1 will say it this way, a king's heart is a water channel in the Lord's hand. He directs it wherever he chooses. Jesus has all wisdom and all strength over the entire world. And so what Jesus is saying to his disciples here in Matthew 28, he's saying, because I am that I am, because I am the great I am, because the Father has given me all authority, because I can handle the weightiness of this, because I can bear the responsibility of being the all-powerful, I am now taking all of my power and my authority, and I am investing it into you. I am empowering you to go and make disciples because you need power to make disciples. Imagine it this way. Imagine you were at that FC soccer game, and the ref points you out, and he says, you, I want you to be the referee. And he has a jersey or a uniform for you. He has a whistle for you, and he gives it to you, and he says, hey, I'm investing my authority and power into you. Go rule the game. Well, you don't know all the rules of the game. So what if the referee said, hey, I'll give you an earpiece, and I'll stand on the sideline, and in your ear, I'll tell you everything to say, everything to do at the exact moment? Well, that's what Jesus is saying, and that's what Jesus is doing. He does not just give us his authority and his power and leave us alone. No, he gives it to us and he helps us. You need God's power to make disciples. Well, how do I get this power? How is this power going to come? I'm glad you asked. Romans chapter 8, verse 9, the Apostle Paul gives us a theology for the Holy Spirit. And what he says is, when you become a believer, a follower of Jesus, at your conversion, the Holy Spirit of God comes to dwell inside of you, and he gives you power. When you repent of your sin, confess, and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, at that moment, the Spirit of God comes to live inside of you, and you have power. Well, John 16, 13 will say the Holy Spirit comes, and he will guide you into all truth. John 14, 26 says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and remind you of all that I have said to you. So the Holy Spirit is a helper, and the Holy Spirit is a guide. In the book of Acts, what we see after Jesus resurrected from the grave is the Holy Spirit coming, and he's coming in the form of power. What we see all throughout the book of Acts is the Holy Spirit giving people the power to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ boldly. That's what we see. The early church was birthed through the power of the Holy Spirit at work in the disciples. So we need the same Holy Spirit to empower us to fulfill the mission of God. In Acts chapter 1 verse 4, Jesus would instruct his disciples, hey, wait for the Holy Spirit because you're going to need the Holy Spirit. Well, what was he saying, wait for the Holy Spirit for? What's, what's the big deal? Well, a couple of verses later, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus will say this, but you will receive power. Everybody say power. power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. So why are you receiving power? You are receiving power because you need to be a witness of the goodness of Jesus. You receive power to go and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Did you know that the Holy Spirit is mentioned some 56 times in the book of Acts alone? And most often when the Holy Spirit is mentioned, it is connected to the Holy Spirit coming upon people and empowering them to preach the good news of Jesus. For example, Acts chapter 4 verse 31 When they had prayed, the place where they were assembled was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God boldly. Acts chapter 19, verse 6, when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. We see the Holy Spirit coming upon people, giving them the ability to preach the gospel and even preach the gospel in a language that other people can understand. The Holy Spirit empowers us to make disciples. And here's the good news for us this morning. If you are a follower of Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit. And if you are a follower of Jesus and you have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you, you have power. You have the power, wonder-working power, to go out and proclaim the goodness of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. You have the power to do what Jesus is now going to ask us to do in verse 19. Verse 18 is the prerequisite for verse 19. Here's what he says in verse 19. 
Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all of my commands. Truth number two, God has a blueprint for how to make disciples. God has a blueprint for how to make disciples. God clearly lays out how you and I to, are to make disciples, and I'm so glad that he doesn't leave it to chance. He doesn't leave it to us to figure it out. No, he's told us what we are to do. The original Greek language and reading of that text goes this way, therefore, as you go, make disciples of all nations. It's a Greek meaning pantate ethne, which means every single ethnic group. As you go, make disciples of all nations, meaning whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever you are doing, you have been called to make disciples. As you go about your day-to-day -day life, as you are a mom, a stay-at-home mom, as you are a dad, as you are a college student, as you are an employer, as you are a business owner, you are to go about making disciples every single day of your life. Making disciples is not just the call for me as the pastor, it's not just the call for the pastoral staff, and it's not just the call for the missionaries who go overseas and preach the gospel. It's for every one of you in this room who follow Jesus. That is your call. It's for everybody. Now, what is a disciple? Well, a disciple, during this time in Jewish culture, there were a rabbi. And rabbis will walk around and they will have something called students, and that was translated into disciples. And so a rabbi was just a Jewish leader and they were highly spiritual in their culture. Their students or disciples would literally follow them around, and the only reason they are following them around is because they are trying to be with their leader and they are trying to become like their leader. They're trying to mimic and imitate their rabbi. Think of it this way. I have three kids, and my youngest, Judah, is a three-year-old. And Judah has a lot of words, and Judah has a lot of opinions, and he's highly expressive. And so Judah likes to go off on his older brothers. He loves to, his, he has this phrase, it's the cutest thing. He can't enunciate L words just yet, so he goes, yeave me alone, yeave me alone. And it's like, oh, you're, this is great. But also, he goes in on his brothers. He's like, pick up your shoes. Daniel, Noah, come pick up your stuff. Get your mess out of the way. Like, he does that. And sometimes when he talks, that head starts to move. Like, when he's expressing his opinions, his head starts to move. Where y'all think he got that from? <laughs> That's right, his mama. Because y'all know I'm a holy man. I don't act like that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he gets it from me. He sees that in me, he hears that, and he is imitating his father. This is what it means to be a disciple. You are imitating your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I love what John Mark Homer says in his book, Practice in the Way. Here's how he defines a disciple. He says, a disciple is a follower of Jesus who seeks to be with Jesus, become like Jesus, and does what Jesus does. A disciple is someone who attempts to be with Jesus, become like Jesus, and do what Jesus does. This is what it means for you and I to be a disciple. Jesus has called you and I to be a disciple and then for us to go out and make more disciples. We do that by the power of the Holy Spirit, urging people to repent of their sins and come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. And then we come alongside of them, helping them to become like Jesus, be with Jesus, and do what Jesus does. One is instant, that's salvation. The other is a lifelong process, that's called sanctification. Jesus has given us this blueprint of how we are to make those disciples. He says, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So we need to baptize people. The church needs to baptize people. You see this tank set up here this morning, and we're going to do baptisms at the end of the sermon. Baptism is a celebratory moment because these people have professed their faith in Jesus Christ. This tank is filled with water because the word baptism in the Greek means baptizo, which means to immerse. They're going to be immersed in the water, and they're going to come out of that water as a new person through the work of Jesus doing on the inside of them. Jesus instituted baptism in Matthew chapter 3, verse 13, where he was baptized by John the Baptist. The practice of baptism was then carried on all throughout the early church until this day. So it is highly important. Peter, in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, will stand before a massive crowd of people, and he will preach the gospel, and he will say to them, repent of your sins, believe in the Lord Jesus, be baptized, and be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
And 3,000 people gave their life to Jesus that day. 3,000 people, imagine that, 3,000 people giving their life to Jesus, being baptized. This was the birth of the first church. What is the big deal about baptism? Well, for starters, Jesus got baptized, and as disciples, we need to imitate what Jesus has done. Secondly, Jesus commands his followers to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we need to be obedient to what the Lord is calling us to do. And then thirdly, baptism is how believers identify with the work of Jesus on the cross. In Romans chapter 6, Paul will say this, or are you unaware that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. Another way to think of this is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, behold, the old has gone and the new has come. As they go down into the water, the old has gone. They are dying to their old life of sin and rebellion. As they come up, they are testifying that I'm walking in newness of life, holiness and chasing after Jesus. Baptism is a marker in a disciple's life of their commitment to Jesus and their wholehearted obedience to him. Secondly, Jesus gives us another blueprint for making disciples, and he says, to teach them to observe everything I have commanded you. Teach them. Teach them what? Teach them to observe everything in the Scriptures, from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Teach them to observe the whole counsel of Scripture. But notice, he doesn't just say observe, he says observe and obey. So it is one thing to have a whole lot of knowledge about God. It is a whole lot, it's one thing to have a whole lot of knowledge about Jesus. It's a whole different ballpark when you are living that out. The church is full of a whole lot of people who have knowledge about Jesus and yet do not live it. I mean, God would even say in his scriptures, hey, even the demons believe and they still don't follow and they still haven't repented. What Jesus is saying here is I don't want a whole lot of disciples walking around with just knowledge about me and knowledge about the scriptures. I want the knowledge that you have to penetrate your heart and your mind and transform your life. It is about change and transformation. The gospel is an inside-out gospel, meaning he is working on the inside of you to transform how you live your life. Teach them to obey all the scriptures. Jesus will say of the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they knew the whole entire law. They knew all the right things, and yet they still did not follow Jesus. And they did not believe in him. And Jesus in Matthew 23, he said to them, you brood of vipers, You're filthy. You're filthy. On the outside, you are clean, but on the inside, you are filthy and you are dead. Jesus wants transformation. I love how John Piper, a pastor, theologian, speaks of the importance of teaching disciples. He says, Jesus said to teach them in such a way that they actually do it. Wow. It's so easy to teach facts, make a list, memorize the facts, study the relationship, understand the facts, but go to hell. To teach the facts, the commands, in such a way that something happens in heart and mind, that's a miracle. That's a miracle. Jesus wants us to disciple people into obedience to the Word of God, to be transformed and become more like Him. Not just head knowledge, but transformation. And church, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Because the reality is, you and I cannot change people. You can't make anybody do anything they do not want to do. You cannot make people love the Lord with all of their heart, their mind, their soul, and their strength. You cannot make people desire to live for Jesus. You can't make anybody do anything. And if I'm honest, that is one of the hardest things for me as a pastor is realizing I can't make you guys do anything. I can't make you do anything. I all day long have desires for you as Mercy Church and Northeast Campus to be a people who are on fire for Jesus, who are zealous for the Lord. I have a desire for you to use the very gifts that God, the creator of the universe, has given you to serve this campus. I have a desire for you to give generously. I have a desire for you to be committed to a community group and love God and chase after him and forsake the things of the world. But church, the reality is I can't make you do that. And I cannot produce that in your heart, but the Holy Ghost can. And that is the role of the Holy Spirit, is to convict you of unrighteousness and sin and compel you to obey the Word of God. You need the Holy Spirit to make disciples. 
Do you get it? Do you see it? Apart from him, you can do nothing, John chapter 15. And if you need the Holy Spirit and his power to make disciples and to reach lost people, my question to you would be, what does your prayer life look like? What does your prayer life look like? How are you praying for lost people? Are you praying for people who are far from Jesus? Are you praying for the people that you are discipling, saying, God, would you change them? Lord, would you give them a desire for you? And are you praying on a daily basis, Holy Spirit, fill me today that I might obey the Scriptures and be a faithful disciple maker? You see, your prayer life is an indicator whether or not you actually believe that you need power from above to make disciples. Your prayer life. We need power from on high to make disciples. As you go make disciples in the power of the Holy Spirit following God's blueprint, notice what Jesus promises you, his presence. In verse 20b, he promises us his presence. He said, and remember, I am with you always to the end of age. This verse is translated in this original language to read, and remember, I am with you the whole of every day. He said, I'm never going to leave you. What I am calling you to is worthy. What I'm calling you to is great. If I'm honest, what God is calling us to is spiritual warfare. It is a task to reach lost people and see them come into the kingdom. And because of that great task, I am going to be with you and I will never leave you. So when disciple making gets messy, when you are persecuted for sharing the gospel, when your one rejects you, when that person you've been investing in decides they're going to walk away and turn away from Jesus, when you're trying to reach people far from God and it's complicated and frustrating, when you want to give up because you keep praying for the same people to get it and they just won't get it, you must remember that God the Father has promised, I am with you. He is with you every second. He is with you every minute. He is with you every hour. He is with you every day until eternity. His presence is promised that he will never leave you. Every one of us in this room has been called to make disciples. It's not a suggestion, church. It's not a recommendation. It's a command from our Lord and Jesus, Savior Christ. Jesus, who left his throne to come on this earth, to be brutally beaten, to have nails driven into his hands and feet, for his intestines to hang out of his side as he was beaten with a cat of nine tails. He died on that cross that he might reconcile all humanity back to a holy and loving God. This Jesus is worthy of our obedience this morning. Revelation 7, 9 through 10 the great apostle will say, I looked out, and behold, before me, there was a great multitude from every nation, tribe, and tongue, and they were gathered around the throne of God, and they began to exclaim, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. We don't get to Revelation 7, 9 through 10 apart from you. That vision that he saw comes to fruition because of you and your faithfulness. I mean, our very own mission statement here at Mercy Church is to love God, love each other, and love our world. Our vision statement says we want to see a gospel awakening in the city of Charlotte that is carried to the ends of the earth, and we can't do that apart from you. We can't do that apart from Mercy Church. You are the church. The people of God is the church, and I need every last one of you to be engaged in the mission. Because we can hasten the day of the Lord's return is what the Scripture says. If we were all active in the mission of God, we can speed up the day Jesus comes back if we will get busy and faithful to the task. You heard Pastor Spence last week say that we want to send 50 by 2030. We want to send 50 people overseas to be missionaries to reach unreached people groups. And so my question is, will you go? Who will go for us? In light of what Jesus has done, will you go? I read this story as I conclude of an African-American woman by the name of Eliza George. 
She was a teacher, and on February 2nd, 1911, during a morning devotional hour at Central Texas College in Waco, Eliza had this vision of black Africans passing before the judgment seat of Christ. And in that vision, she said, I heard them weeping and moaning, and many of them were saying, no one ever told us you died for us. A few years early, Eliza George responded to an invitation to volunteer missionary work. And now she felt that God was putting this vision before her, prodding her heart to go overseas and become a missionary in Africa. The college president tried to dissuade her, and he said, don't let yourself get carried away by that foolishness. You don't have to go over there to be a missionary. We have enough Africa over here. It will take two more years on December 12, 1913, before Eliza George was set sail from New York to Liberia to become a National Baptist missionary. She finally got up enough courage to leave her teaching position. And in her resignation speech, she read this poem, and it reads, My African brother is calling me. Hark, hark, I hear his voice. Would you say stay when God said go? Would you bow your heads with me? May that pierce your heart in this moment. Would you say stay when God said go? All of us have to go. And for some of us, God is calling you to go overseas. But every last one of us has to go to a neighbor, a coworker, a friend, a relative, somebody. And what I want you to do is I want you to sit in that moment, this moment for the next 90 seconds, and I want you to ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what are you calling me to do next? How are you calling me to get engaged in the mission of God and sharing the gospel? And I pray that the Spirit will speak to you and give you an action step. And then I'm going to come back in a moment. I'm going to lead us through a time of prayer. Maybe for you this morning, your next step is to literally walk across the street and invite your unsaved neighbor over for dinner. Maybe the Lord is prompting in your heart that you need to engage a neighbor. Maybe it's someone on campus that you need to go and invite them to hang out with you. Maybe for some of you, it is the Lord is asking you to go home and this evening you need to share the gospel with a relative. There's someone in your family who does not know Jesus, and the Lord is saying, hey, you need to call them. Maybe for some of you, your next step is to come down front and find a pastor or staff member who has on a blue lanyard, and maybe you just need to say, hey, I feel like the Lord is prompting me to go overseas. I don't even know what this means, and I need help processing and discerning what the Lord is calling me to. What are you going to do next in light of what Jesus has done for you? Father, we pray in the mighty name of Jesus, and we thank you so much for the cross of Calvary. Lord, we thank you for the blood of Jesus that has made us clean. We thank you for Jesus' body that was broken on that cross that has now called us to be sons and daughters. We are the redeemed of the Lord. And Lord, I pray specifically for the person in the room who is not a follower of you, God. Maybe their next step right now is to profess faith in you, to say, Lord Jesus, I have sinned against you. I have failed, and I need help, and I need you to come into my life and save me. And for that person, Lord, if they pray that, we know that the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of them instantly to help them live a holy life and to follow you. Lord, I pray whatever our next steps are, Lord, would you empower your people right now to be obedient? God, I pray that people will not be able to sleep tonight. 
because they are wrestling with obedience to you. They are wrestling with engaging their neighbors. They are wrestling with, they have not prioritized the great commission over everything else in their lives. And Spirit of God, I pray that you will convict and that you will nudge and you will call people to repentance and action. Even in my own life, there is someone that I know that I need to text that I have neglected to text, Lord, and I ask for forgiveness. And I ask God that I will get out of the way of my own selfishness and that I will reach out to this man and pursue him, Lord, though it is very challenging. Because Jesus, you are worthy of it all. You took the cross, you paid our penalty, and now we declare you're worthy of it all. And it's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen.